So people of my vintage or older might remember certain American programs back in the late when we saw Amer Americans, right, who had telephones in their bedrooms. Remember that? Do you remember, like most Irish homes, we used to put the telephone just inside the front door in the corridor, which ordinarily most Irish homes was freezing, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to take a phone call, you had to sit there, right? And you had to, oh, maybe we, we could only call after six. It was much cheaper after six o'clock. So you could only make calls after six o'clock and you'd have to sit there in the car. Everyone, everyone walked by. I mean, that's where it would, the, everyone upstairs could hear. And you're there in the freezing corridor on the phone. And that was the only phone in the house. Phone, we thought we were class. But then the second person could just lift up the phone <laughs> and listen to everything. You know, and we thought, they have these Americans, they're in the room, you know, and they're like, yeah, Todd, I know, it's so hard. I have to go out now and scrape the lake, the, the, the leaves off our pool. Life is so difficult. You know, and we, we were just uh, looking at this lifestyle going, wow, imagine what that would be like. And there was, remember, there was a show called Silver Spoons, you know, and um, in the opening credits, the guy was so rich that he had a, a small train, um, an old school train, like a, like, like a steam train kind of a thing, that he would sit on that would bring him from the living room to the kitchen kind of thing. You know, it was just a, it had a train with, with trolleys and what, for carriages on it and you know he just kind of silver spoons together and um an interesting thing though about those shows dallas included by the way which i wasn't allowed to watch because i was too young my parents wouldn't allow me to watch dallas uh, so i have no idea who jr ewing was but or who shot him for that matter uh, but the interesting thing was even though these, these families were so rich and all of that they had problems just like everyone else even the silver spoons one right he's like this kid was just loaded with dosh I don't think his mom wasn't on the scene or something, but whatever it was, he just had problems just like everyone else, problems with friends, problems at school, and just different problems or maybe similar problems, but problems nonetheless. And it's just so interesting like how we so easily buy into this lie, if you've got money, you've got no problems. If you've got money, the more money you have, the less problems you have. The more money you have, the more freedom you can have, the happier you are. Money equals freedom. It's just one big fat lie. It really is. I have a a friend of mine over in Naples, and the family is being torn apart because back in the day, the family built a block of apartments, but then obviously it's now worth a fortune because you have, I don't know how many people live there, 60, 70 little apartments. In, uh, they'd call it a palazzo. That's a high-rise high -rise flat, but snobbier than a high-rise flat. High-rise apartments, we'll say. Uh, so it's worth a fortune. But then, like, every time someone dies, right, Every time someone dies who owns a portion of this building, World War III breaks out. I, am, I don't want that one, I want that one, I want this one, and then that, that fire exit is mine, that fire exit is yours, and I want... And every single time, there's then just the kind of culture, they, if, suing, counter-suing, counter-suing, it's just ridiculous, absolutely. When I read this, like this, when I read this, 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 this today's gospel, it just came to me, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter at all. I won't go into the details of some of the situations that have been described, but you know those kind of cousins that no one even knew were part of the family, right? Until someone is near their death, and then they start to circle. <laughs> Your long-lost cousins from Botswana come back and decide to visit. Oh, Mary, we heard you were sick. Who are you? <laughs> I'm your cousin from Botswana. Ah. Oh. Is that why you came back? Because you heard I was sick and I own that, that apartment over there. Is that it? You know, and that's exactly what was going on. Just coming back, just to circle over before the person died. And it's just so shallow. Absolutely ridiculous. In our sacristy here, uh, one of the girls made me a little gift last year, which says, O priest of God, celebrate this Mass as if it is your first Mass, and as, as if it is your last Mass, as if it is your only Mass. So that's what I see every in, in the sacristy before I come out here, before every Mass. Celebrate this as if it's your only Mass, as if it's your last Mass, as if it's your first Mass. And that's not only a very good way of celebrating Mass, a very good attitude to have before one celebrates Mass, that's a very good attitude to have for life. Live this day as if it's your first day, as if it's your last day, as if it's your only day. Do the good you can do today because you're going to go. 
I had to give a talk to the Eucharistic adorers in this diocese, Lord from Lismore, uh, a week, two, two or three weeks ago at this stage, whatever, two weeks, three weeks ago. And um, it just, it really struck me how much, how much fear there was out there, that, that was out there. Now, maybe my strategy was completely wrong, but my strategy was, don't be afraid of death, don't be afraid of COVID, because you're gonna die anyway. Now, maybe, I think that, that consoles me, maybe it didn't console them, I'm not sure. I don't know, uh, but I, it, does, it does actually, in, a, in an odd way, kind of console me. We're going to die anyway. It's not like COVID suddenly is going to bring about death, and if it wasn't for that, we'd live forever. No, we're going to go, something's going to get us eventually. But you don't live in fear of it, you live prepared for it. There's also talk about the three days darkness and this kind of thing, and the fear of all of that. Now, not, it's not to give any kind of less credence to these things, but I have to be ready for the three days darkness of four years darkness or 22 years darkness tomorrow anyway. I have to be ready today for these things. That's why after this mass, I'm actually going to a priest friend of mine to go to confession. Not because, not because the three days darkness is this Wednesday, but, <laughs> but, but because it could be any day. And I could actually get killed on, on the way to kill Sheelan. I don't know. It's not like we, we, we never live in fear of death because death's gonna come anyway. It's gonna come anyway. So rather than living in fear of death, it's almost like we should have a, almost have a greater fear that I don't live a life of love, that I don't live today with as much love as I can put into it. That should be a greater fear in our lives, that we mess up what we actually have in our hands as opposed to being afraid of something that might happen 10, 20 years' time. Live today with as much love as you can. Don Bosco was talking to Dominic Savio. Dominic Savio was a a young boy in his um, oratory, it was called. It was a group uh, of young, like a youth group that they had. He had an orphanage there as well. And he asked Dominic Savio, he said, Dominic, if you were to die, what would you do right now? And he says, with the football in his hands, I'd finish this game of football. And like what Don Bosco understood was just the the purity of soul of this guy, that we shouldn't be living thinking, oh, I should have done this. I should have asked that person for forgiveness. I should have prayed. I should have, I should have, I should have. Do what you're supposed to do. Do it. And then there's no regrets. So, like, if you want to die tomorrow, what would you do? You should, well, more or less, we should be saying, I do exactly what I'm doing now. I'd spend time with my husband, my, my wife, with my kids. I'd work hard. I'd be reconciled with God and be reconciled with the people around me. That's the way we're supposed to live anyway. So interiorly, we don't need kind of, well, let's be careful not to misunderstand what I'm saying. Interiorly, we don't need to live in fear of these things. But we live prepared for these maybe big things that may happen, may happen, will happen eventually, but may happen in our time, the big interventions of God in history. But we have to live prepared for them anyway. Because we may be gone before they even happen. But then you're not afraid because I'm, I'm ready to go whenever. Like a friend of mine, I just heard today, uh, passed away. Now, he had, he had lived to a very good age, but for the last 10 years, he was pretty much living the life of uh, a holy brother. Uh, he prays bravery every day, adoration when he could, just a very, very pure soul. Uh, and he died now in his late 80s. And if while it's sad, I'm kind of, I'm happy for him. You know, he's lived a good life. He's, he's, he's died now reconciled with everyone. No regrets. No regrets at all. And ready, ready to meet his maker. It's probably already happened. He's probably looking down on me right now. And what a way to live, like, ready to go. The saints of today, Jean de Brebeuf and Isaac Jogues and their companions. I found a book when I was in the seminary uh, about Jean de Brebeuf and... Uh, I was reading through it, and it was the first time I came across a really manly saint, and I loved it. It was just, ooh, yeah. <laughs> it was just, yeah, like you turn page after page. He was a big guy, physically a big guy, tall and broad. Uh, and he went to modern-day Quebec to uh, do his mission amongst the, the Huron tribe there. So he was a Jesuit priest. And, like... While there was a certain amount of kind of glory, if you will, about going to, to foreign missions, there was also a huge amount of danger, and they knew it. They knew it. Like, they did... 
things were very, very different over there. Like Christianity had never touched that soil before. So their mentality, their customs uh, were, were, were very, very different at times, very, very base. Like amongst the Hurans, uh, your dreams were considered prophecies, right? That sounds lovely, doesn't it? If you're a teenage boy or, you know, the things they dream should not be prophecies, okay? So then the lads would dream these things and then say, oh my goodness, I dreamt about her. Well, I guess that means, and, uh, and that's the kind of thing that was happening. It was so just awful, really based stuff going on. And like the, the, the abject poverty, I mean, so you'd have to light a fire indoors in your tent, light a fire in a tent, Anyone's, anyone seeing what the problem is going to be here? Or uh, these kind of cabins that they had as well. Just dense smoke, burning eyes, everything stinks. All right, but if not, you freeze. That's, that's how it was done, you know? So conditions were hard. They were just really, really awful. That, of course, on, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that we as, well, Jean de Rebeuf and Isaac Jogues and them, being Europeans, being white men, we were blamed for everything that went wrong, right? So it's not raining, it's your fault because you're white, <laughs> right? Or, or it's, it's, the winter is longer than usual, our crops failed, it's your fault. They were very superstitious, so you're the only thing that's different around here, so it's your fault. Or your God is, is cursing us, you know? So you lived in constant danger, as he says himself, of getting your head split open because it hasn't rained certain things you have no control over. That on, on top of that, you half understand their language. And it, and like for, for months at the beginning, you're lip reading and trying to put the sounds together and trying to, this thing means that sound. How do you say it again? It's got an umlaut, what? So very, very difficult. Uh, so um, all of this combined. And then you make a convert and then they're rejected by their family, so they revert, as in they apostatize. And then you're trying to make con converts again. Just <laughs> hard as hard could be. Hard as hard could be. So he, he was making some headway, and things started to improve. He learned their language eventually, who were on language, wrote a catechism for them, uh, would teach them, trying to root out all of the superstition and fear of God, trying to root out these... Um, I'd say very degenerate custom, customs that were there as well, and uh, teach them who God is and what the, the, the dignity of, of the human being and what, what we're called to and what heaven is about, how it works. And the Hurons were invaded then by the Iroquois. They're another tribe. They used to often fight for land and territory, and the Iroquois were re re renowned for their cruelty. So they captured these white Europeans, and they wouldn't just kill you because that would be merciful. So they were, they were tortured uh, slowly. So they were beaten with, with sticks, which would obviously hurt quite a lot, then skinned slowly. And they were also, they were tied, the men were tied, the priests were tied. And um, the Iroquois children came and ate their fingers and what, ears, whatever they could get to. Then hatchets were put into the fire till they'd load red and they were put on the person to burn them and cauterize the wound at the same time so you wouldn't die. Um, horrific stuff, absolutely horrific. So what struck me though about this was, it was the, I suppose the, the genius of the author of the book who said he was willing to trade his own life for the 7,000 converts that he made while there. He was willing to pay for, the, for those 7,000 converts with his own life. That's faith. That's faith. So, good Lord, we ask you that you, our good Lord, our good Savior, that you will prepare us every day as if this were our last, that we may live this day with no regrets, live this day with love, live this day in peace with you and peace with our neighbor. So when you call us to ourself, yourself, we will be ready, that we may never live in fear of anything or anyone, for you are our Lord and Savior. Amen.